Hello and welcome back to New Scientist TV. This month we uncover a secretive pollinator and take a look inside some ancient teeth. But first, let's visit a lab that houses a unique blend of shy loner and party animal. Of course, I'm talking about the desert locust. I'm here with zoologist Jeremy Niven in a room full of locusts at Cambridge University. Uh, Jeremy, can you tell me a little bit about the creatures behind us? Yeah, what you can see behind you are actually solitary locusts. Um, and these are the locusts that live at, at very low levels in the desert and get together to form the kind of swarms that we, we all see on the news. What is the, what is the benefit of the, the solitary locusts then? The solitary locusts are used by um, people in the department to allow them to study the formation of the swarm itself and right. how animals in the desert go from being um, solitary and cryptic and very shy to being these kind of party animals that form huge swarms. Last year, another team in the department found that the chemical serotonin is involved in this transformation. Serotonin levels in their nervous systems increase when they're around other locusts. With the gregarious animals, it's important that they actually do see one another and smell one another. The solitary locusts were too shy to take part in Niven's latest research, but luckily gregarious locusts were willing to cooperate. He's been watching them walk along ladders. His team has been trying to find out if the creatures use vision or their antennae to find their footing. We discovered that locusts use vision to place their forelimbs on each rung of the ladder that they were walking along. But we also discovered that they use vision only at the beginning of each step and not during the step, and that's quite different to the way humans use vision. If we stumble, we look for a new place to put our foot before we hit the ground. But locusts don't seem to be able to make such last-minute adjustments. So is it just vision in touch, or, or do they use other senses? Although locusts rely a lot on their visual system, they also use olfaction, just like we do. They, they smell their environment, and they can actually choose where to go based on, based on what they can smell. Here, the insect is given a choice of different smells. In previous training, it had learned to associate one of them with a food reward. It chooses the arm with the odour that tells it there's going to be food. But for how long can it remember that a specific odour is linked to a treat? Another setup is the locust equivalent of Pavlov's famous conditioning experiment with dogs. It should reveal more about the long-term memory of locusts. Next up, we find out what high-tech dental scans are telling us about our ancestors. Sandrine Kirstemont takes up the tale. In 1998, the skeleton of an early modern human was discovered in Lagervelho, Portugal. It was found to be the remains of a child who lived 25,000 years ago, at the same time as Neanderthals. Scientists have often assumed that our early ancestors were almost identical to us, but now a team is getting more insight by scanning this child's teeth. This is the stack of slices we obtained after the acquisition, and uh, this is the images we obtained after reconstruction. And here you have the tooth with the enamel in white. You have the dentin, this is the main core of the tooth. And in green, here appears the enamel cap. Bale and her team examined the proportions of different tissues, such as enamel and dentine. They compared this with the teeth of living humans, as well as with Neanderthal teeth. For the molars, the Lagarvela child has a very living human-like uh, pattern of dental tissue. But for the incisors, uh, the Lagarvela child displays a pattern closer to the Neanderthal teeth. The analysis revealed a mix of Neanderthal and living human features. But Bale isn't surprised by these contradictory results. It just reflects the poor knowledge we have of the early modern humans. Few studies have examined the teeth of our direct ancestors in such detail. It's partly because 3D scanning techniques have only been available to paleontologists in the past decade. It really changes the way we consider and we study teeth. Usually paleontologists have studied the external structure of teeth and the internal structure. It was possible to examine it uh, using radiographs, but in 2D. The technology should now allow more scientists to peer inside early human teeth. It could reveal a lot more than just clues about their dentition. The growth of the teeth is um, well correlated with other aspects of general growth. In all primates, 
the brain reach uh, approximately 90% of its final volume broadly at the moment of the first permanent molar emergence. Bale is convinced that further research into our ancestors is needed. They were not just older version than us, and we cannot describe them uh, with a simple dichotomy between Neanderthals and recent humans. And finally, while digging into a botanical mystery, scientists made a chance discovery. James Urquhart tells us more. The comet orchid hides its nectar at the bottom of a long spur. But what creature can reach it? In 1903, a moth with a tongue just as long was caught pollinating the flower. Now researchers are investigating the relatives of this orchid. But these plants have much shorter spurs. We wanted to know what was pollinating those plants on reunion, because it's always viewed that when you get these very specialized types of pollinations, that that's an evolutionary dead end. That is, you can't get from that very long spur back to a shorter spur. Claire Michonneau, one of the team members, observed the orchids during the daytime. The pollinator for two of the species was soon revealed. She was able to document the little Zosterops bird, a songbird, uh, visiting these plants and collecting nectar out of their short nectar spurs um, and picking up the pollen masses of the orchids. Part of the mystery was solved, but a third type of orchid had not been pollinated. To see if it was being visited at night, Michino set up infrared cameras. She set this up and then was very surprised, of course, to see this little uh, larval stage cricket visiting the flowers and removing the pollen masses. Of course, that's the first time any such insect has ever been documented to be a regular pollinator. Crickets normally destroy plants, so their helpful role was a surprise. But the team also made another discovery. The cricket species was entirely new to science. These crickets are very special crickets because each night they go back to the same nest. They have the capacity to locate particular landmarks in their environment and it means that they can return to the orchid flowers and collect nectar and pollinate more of the flowers. The team thinks these crickets could be pollinating other plants as well. This includes creeping down into longer spurred orchids to collect nectar. If the opening to the spur is broad, then a short tongued pollinator like the little songbirds and the cricket can actually get some nectar and that sets up a situation where selection can favor the orchids that have shorter spurs. This shows that there are ways out of these apparent evolutionary dead ends. That's all for now, but you can find loads more videos on our website. Find out how our brains react to virtual robots and see how a new system could save skiers in an avalanche. See you next time.